uh, Commissioner, it doesn't get any better than that. Sure doesn't. <laughs> Please proceed. Is this televised? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is my third time testifying. <clears throat> Actually, as uh, following the Senator's remarks, I'd like to decline to read my written testimony. It's been submitted for the record, obviously. But rather, I'd uh, prefer to share a couple of stories um, that are going on right now in Baltimore, which is, you know, is a mid-sized American city. And I'd just like to talk about some of the problems we're encountering at the ground level uh, that are, I think, are, it's, I've chosen to do this because after hearing all the testimony from Governor Gilmore on, I think it kind of underscores the problems we're facing at the very local level. Um, because if, indeed, the federal government says there's a 100 percent chance we will be hit again, and as we've heard from the previous testimony, it is going to be a local response, of course. Um, we are still, still encountering difficulties defending our cities, despite the improvements made. And I would just like to talk about a few of them that people may or may not know about. All the ones I'll talk about, I, uh, I can now because they've been out in the public, in the press. I'll just leave out names and addresses if uh, they're pending investigations. Um, one of the things I found rather chilling is something that happened on September 10th. And I have to go back to my experience with the New York City Police uh, about 12 years ago, because it, there are striking similarities in both the, the findings and the response. But on uh, November 5th of 1990, I was a lieutenant with the New York City Police Department. And as uh, we all know now, there was an assassination of a radical Jewish leader in the Marriott Hotel on uh, Lexington Avenue in Manhattan. After he was killed, the assassin ran out of the ballroom onto Lexington Avenue. Um, jumped into a yellow taxi cab, jumped immediately out, was confused, encountered a police officer who he shot, was shot and returned fire, and wounded at the scene where we had our arrest of our murderer. Um, going through his pockets and his papers, obviously we found out where he lived. Uh, upon arriving at his house, um, we found other gentlemen, also I believe from Egypt, who answered the door. Um, and what do you think they did for a living? They were New York City cab drivers, who admit being at the scene at the time of the homicide. So pretty clear to us that he jumped in the wrong taxi. We did a search warrant of the house, and in the warrant we came up with huge, voluminous, according to sources I've spoken to, is the biggest al-Qaeda seizure in, uh, on American soil still. And there were photographs of New York City landmarks, writings in, in Arabic and, and Farsi, uh, diagrams and notebooks and the like. And all these things were seized by us and uh, the New York City police and brought back to my office. The next day, of course, we gave a briefing to our superiors. Um, the question that was posed to me and my detectives was, can you tell me this man acted alone, a lone gunman? To which the response was, of course not. He at least had two other people with him, with the, you know, the getaway drivers. Um, we were told, you shut up, you handle the murder, they handle the, uh, the conspiracy, they being the Joint Terrorism Task Force. So uh, from that day on, our files were turned over, cases went in different directions. We handled the murder, they handled the uh, terrorism investigation. Almost so, two years later, there was an explosion at the World Trade Center. I was summoned back to listen to tapes, review documents and the like, um, only to find out that those documents that we turned over were not translated until midway through the bombing trial of the first Trade Center. The people that I released from my office, one of them actually drove the van into the, the World Trade Center in 93. The people that I released from my office, one of them actually drove the van into the, the World Trade Center in 93. It's bothered me for a long time. It's now subject to books. So we can talk about this publicly. Um, I bring this up because on September 10th of this year, um, in our city, in Baltimore, my detectives were out on a routine arson warrant. They uh, find the subject who they're going to arrest for uh, an arson and a harassment. And in the apartment, they encounter um, eight men from various countries, from Morocco, Pakistan, Somalia, and Afghanistan. Um, in a, the apartment is very sparsely furnished, hardly any furniture, but there are computers and documents, passports, and the like that do not belong to them, of people with different names and photographs. There are also photographs of some landmarks, like uh, Union Station in Washington, D.C., Times Square, New York. There are also computers that we see and cell phones. We got a search warrant for these. They were downloaded by our police department. And in there, we find that in the week preceding 
September 10th, which we've got to keep in mind that today we are told we are in a very high state of alert, um, we find that they were on the Internet for hours at a time in the middle of the night checking out websites such as learntofly.com, beapilot.com, all local airports, and the like. Further analysis of their hard drive that was erased shows photographs of jetliners uh, and many other things. The reason we bring this up now is I don't know what these men have or have not done other than what I've told you. The investigation continues. But several were released by the federal government that day. And until then, not only that, worse than that, we were told that there's nothing more than expired visa violations on these folks, and there's nothing to indicate an existence of a terrorist cell. Well, that may be true on its face. I mean, if you're waiting for a notarized plan with a list of terrorists, it's going to be a long wait. This is chillingly, eerily similar to what we encountered years ago and encountered here and there through our daily work as police officers in this country. And to be told this by our federal partners is very disturbing to us. And that's where we stand right now. That investigation continues. And there are a couple of more anecdotal ones I'd like to share with you just as part of what's happened in the year since September 11th to date. Um, we had two men on September 11th of 2001, the day this country was attacked, who was seen celebrating the World Trade Center attacks by a delivery man who was smart enough to call the police. We apprehend, we went in, talked to them, brought them in for questioning. There was subsequently released, um, I believe by the FBI, there was no evidence to hold them at the time, which may have been uh, the case. June of this year, we were notified and asked for our help very quickly to please apprehend someone. Um, we ran them through our intelligence division database, and of course, it was one of the people from that night. The point of that little story is the fact that we had no idea that there was an impending investigation on these folks who live in my city. Um, we also had, as you probably know by now, on June 24th, Ramsey al Shanak was arrested on Lehigh Street in Baltimore. Uh, he was a previous roommate with Hani Hanjour and Hawak al Hazmi, the uh, September 11th hijackers. We were notified of this investigation three days before it was taken down. We have, this is the one that I really would like to bring to everyone's attention. We have also, we, we have a very competent intelligence division in our department, as most major city police departments. We run our own investigations and run them pretty well. But we also check with our federal counterparts to make sure we're not wasting resources and disrupting anybody else's work. We have someone now who we, were, we are investigating. He's a uh, rather radical in our city. Um, we asked our counterparts, do you have anything going on this? And of course, we're told absolutely not. We continue with the investigation, and there was a blind hit in one database that alerted them to the fact we're still investigating this subject, at which time we were notified and said, could we come talk to you? The person we said, we're not investigating. Well, actually, we are investigating, and we need to come talk to you about it, but we couldn't really tell you at the time. There are others, but that's enough for now. I just wanted the statement I'd like to make, and the fact is I don't, uh, I'm representing myself. I don't represent the major city chiefs or the IACP, um, but there are several vocal chiefs in this country who feel same way. Unfortunately, most of them complain privately, and when they're asked publicly, they don't want to say anything for what reasons only known to them. But if we're talking about this as a local response, and there is a need to know, who do, who do we think needs to know more than the chiefs who protect the city, city citizens? We need to know more than anybody in this country what's going on in our cities, yet we don't. And I defy anybody, you can call people today from any major American city to ask them what's going on in their cities regarding terrorist investigations today. I think you'd be surprised at the response. Um, I think I'm going to stop there and answer any questions you may have from the Senate.